Okay, uh, so uh, it's really an honor to uh, have this opportunity to uh, give this talk at this occasion. Uh, it's a wonderful conference. I'd like to thank the organizers for doing a marvelous job. Huh? Um, well, so this is a kind of survey talk, and uh, I apologize to those who know the subject. There will be very little which is new to them, ah, which will be new to them. Um, I hope there will be a little bit at least. Uh, well, what's the justification for giving such a talk? I think uh, there seems to be uh, quite a bit of interest in uh, developments uh, centering around uh, the existence of these resolutions. They've come up in several talks, I think, in, in Agnes's talk, in Mike's talk, in Haynes's talk, in, uh, in like Jacob's talk. I, I may have forgotten some, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so chromatic homotopy theory clearly seems to be something which is uh, very, very much alive, very active. Uh, and so maybe that's a justification. And there's also a justification uh, which is, I mean, also Paul sort of doesn't really want to uh, that we talk about that much, but uh, <clears throat> he's been a very active player in this development, and uh, so I think it's uh, maybe also a, a good justification uh, for giving such a talk. Huh? Okay, uh, so the background, chromatic homotopy theory has uh, been sort of mentioned, has been sort of outlined in several talks. I will be very brief on that. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, so uh, one central thing in chromatic homotopy theory is will be localization functors, so it will be Bausfield localization. With respect to the functor which sends a spectrum X to um, well, the direct sum of its first I Morava K theories. <coughs> Uh, where the convention is, as usual, that K0 is rational homology. <coughs> and Ki, well, you have a choice, but uh, you can choose that uh, to be uh, the <coughs> classical Morava K theories, which are periodic with period two times P to the n minus one. <coughs> And uh, so these functors, uh, Ln, uh, play an important role. In fact, these functors, Ln, can be sort of uh, analyzed in terms of more elementary functors. That's, like, uh, that's the localizations with respect to Kn. Okay? So that's the uh, so on more of our K theories. Uh, so the case uh, n equals zero is sort of uh, consider trivial. I mean, we, this is understood since the work of Serre in the 50s. Uh, the case n equals 1, we'll come back to that, but that's uh, the part which is sort of, which we really understand well. Uh, and with n equals 2, uh, things, uh, well, we understand quite a bit more now than we understood 20 years ago. Um, we understand more every day, I think. Um, but uh, there are still sort of uh, quite a number of interesting questions to be uh, to be understood, and beyond n equals 2, it's not quite clear maybe what the right questions are. I think Mike has maybe uh, pointed out an interesting question that uh, might actually sort of uh, influence sort of the further development quite a bit. <coughs> um, okay, so, <coughs> um, so how does one study these functors? So, uh, so these functors are studied via certain uh, other uh, homology theories, the so-called Murava E theories, so there's uh, in this in all this picture, of course, I mean, as well, I mean, only repeating it for those maybe who really uh, haven't heard 
talks about that much before. Uh, there is an implicit prime which is never sort of mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, doesn't, doesn't show up in the <coughs> notation afterwards. <coughs> so I mean this prime here is sort of implicit um, and it's only for n equals zero that they, all the primes sort of become the same. <coughs> Uh, so this prime will be never be, uh, well, well, it will, will be suppressed in the notation, but we will later on uh, talk about what happens at different primes. Okay, <clears throat> okay so uh, these, uh, uh, these are cohomology theories. These are complex-oriented uh, cohomology theories. Uh, so they have uh, formal groups attached to them from a group loss once you chose, uh, once you've chosen an orientation. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the pi zero of this E uh, classifies deformations uh, of uh, a chosen height n formal group law over uh, where pi zero of E will be in fact a complete uh, local ring, it has a maximal ideal, and if you divide out by that, you get a perfect field. And for most of the time, we will assume that this perfect field is a finite field. In fact, for most of the time, we will uh, assume that this is the prime field. <clears throat> but there's, there's a choice here. Huh? There's a choice here. Uh, well, the former group law is not unique. I mean, it's not even sort of a, uh, a preferable one. I mean. Uh, there's a choice of form a group law, a form a group, uh, over, and there's a choice of a field. So in fact, we should actually, uh, this En, uh, more precisely, I mean, there should be called E maybe a gamma N and K. And so they depend on this couple of a choice of form a group law of height N over a perfect field of uh, characteristic P. Um, and, uh, and so there, in fact, there are interesting different choices. I mean, the classical choice is the Honda formal group law, but choices which have become uh, important in recent years are sort of uh, formal group laws uh, associated to super singular elliptic curves. Huh? <clears throat> and, well, for, for, for for much of the story, I mean, this choice sort of doesn't really matter. It's sort of, when it comes to fine detail, uh, where you sort of see differences, and I think for those who really uh, don't really know much about the subject, you might just ignore that issue. Hmm? So, in fact, but these formal group laws, they have automorphisms. So these are the k-linear automorphisms uh, the, the k algebra automorphisms uh, of gamma n, if gamma n is defined over k. And if you choose your formal group law reasonable, uh, then this group is independent of n, and k, of n and k as soon as k becomes large enough, say k uh, of gamma n and k, uh, if gamma n is chosen carefully. And k contains uh, k contains uh, the field with p to the n element, where n is the height. Huh? <clears throat> yeah. uh, and so the common value of these groups will be typically typically uh, denoted by S n, huh? so uh, independent of, of the choice. I mean, with respect to some care. <clears throat> uh, now, if the formal group law, as we will choose in the future, or in, in the sequel, is actually already defined over k, you have uh, another formal group law, and you have another, another automorphism group, that's automorphism groups which allow sort of field automorphisms, and then you get actually a, a semi-direct product And here I think I should actually, I need to, I mean, if I want to be careful, I really have to write down the, the couple because this other group does depend on the choice. But it's sort of 
the part of the story which is fine detail and which you might sort of ignore if you sort of haven't really heard about these things before. <clears throat> okay. Um, well maybe I should move my computer to the front so I don't have to make these trips. <clears throat> um, Okay, now this group, uh, these groups Sn, uh, respectively, respectively Gn, or G, sorry, there's no index for a double index, uh, or G gamma n k, they act on E gamma, uh, well, they act on the theory. Uh, they act on the theory, they act on the coefficients. Uh, and uh, this action is very interesting and very important. And in fact, what's even more important is that this uh, action can be rigidified. Uh, we can ha actually have an action. Uh, this has a, can, give, can be given a structure of an E infinity spectrum and sort of it acts on this uh, spectrum by E infinity maps. Oh. And let me sort of push uh, the fine detail under the carpet and maybe only get to that, uh, get back to that at the very end. <clears throat> and if I push it under the carpet, then I mean the gamma n will be sort of, uh, will have disappeared from the notation. <clears throat> so this is uh, the celebrated Hopkins Miller Gauss theorem. You have this, um, this action, this rigidification of this action, and as a, as a consequence, you can fabricate something which is, which one can call a homotopy fixed point spectrum. Uh, it's sort of a, it has all the expected properties of a homotopy fixed point spectrum. Um, uh, and there's this beautiful metric formula that in fact the Kn local sphere, uh, the result of the sphere localized at Kn is actually give, equal to this homotopy fixed point spectrum. Uh, so that's Another celebrated theorem by David Knights and Hopkins. Huh? Now, this theorem gives rise, or this explains, uh, if you want, uh, a change of ring isomorphisms due to Murava uh, in terms of uh, an associated homotopy uh, descent spectral sequence. It has an E2 term. Which is given by, say, there's a. This is a. This is a complicated group. These groups S n are complicated groups. They're p-adic Lie groups. Uh, um, well, they're profiler groups, but they have sort of this additional structure, and so they are, They act on these uh, coefficient modules, which I haven't really. I haven't told you anything about it. <clears throat> uh, these are. Well, I mean, they have actually made it on this blackboard before on, during this conference. So. Uh, these are power series rings. I mean, in dimension zero, this is a huge power series ring. Well, depends on n. It's a power series ring on n minus one deformation parameters, which are all in degree zero. And it's periodic, because it's a complex-oriented um, periodic cohomology theory. And so the u um, can be chosen to begin minus two, but if you uh, if you, I mean, you can choose it to be two if you want, but then you're not doing things right. Huh? <laughs> um, okay, so there's this E2 term, um, and that's a spectral sequence which converges to the homotopy group of the sphere. Well, not quite. If you work with this group Sn, you have to actually sort of uh, look at something which is an extension of that. You, uh, this will be sort of. Uh, uh, the homotopy groups will be modules over the p-adics, and you sort of go up from the p-adics to the vit vectors. So these, are, in fact, are the vit vectors of uh, the field fp to the n. Okay. Uh, if you really want, so that's pretty close to what you really want to understand. Uh, um, it's a little, it's not quite, uh, it's not quite ideal. I mean, ideally, you would like to have it converging to that, and, and you can have that, but then you have to look at the fine detail, 
and you look at the, uh, uh, this group, which I said you might ignore, um, which acts on this thing. This thing is still, I mean, sort of, this is, I mean, the algebra here is independent, but the sort of the action, uh, there is the Galois group which acts and, and sort of the way the Galois group sort of is put together uh, with this group SN, sort of that's, uh, that's something where the choice make, uh, plays a role. And then you get a speckle sequence which actually converges to, to this. Okay. <clears throat> so that's, um, I did start at 40 roughly, yeah? Okay. Okay, um, so that's uh, sort of the background. Uh, well, the question you can ask, I mean, what, what is this bias? Huh? Uh, I mean, sort of, uh, <coughs> these, these things have been studied before uh, in work by Shimamura and, uh, well, even can start, could say, I mean, that, that been, the start goes back to uh, Miller, Robin, L. Wilson, maybe. Uh, uh, they have been studied before, but more in terms of Hopf algebraids, Hopf algebraid cohomology. Uh, the groups sort of were known to exist, but they didn't really sort of make it actively into the picture. Hmm? I mean, here they sort of really sort of prominently in the picture, and in fact, uh, this point of view, which sort of, I mean, uh, so the, this. This opens a new perspective, and we can really sort of think about these groups, properties of these groups, uh, and 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 try to to use what we I mean what we know about these groups in order to understand uh, the structure of this thing better, uh, and maybe also I mean not only the structure of this, but also understand this part, inspired by what we know or what we learn about <coughs> uh, the cohomology of these groups. <coughs> So some of that has actually uh, shown up uh, in Agnes's talk, uh, in, in Mike's talk. So the first case is uh, the case n equals 1. Okay. Uh, so that's LK1 of S0. LK1 of S0, as we've learned uh, in Mike's talk, uh, can be, well, so E1. So, okay, so now we should demystify a little bit the group uh, and, and the cohomology theory. Uh, so in this case, E1 is just uh, <coughs> periodically completed K-theory, and G1 is equal to S1. Uh, so the choice of the former group, which, I mean, there are still choices, but uh, because G1 is equal to S1, uh, it doesn't really, <coughs> doesn't really matter. Uh, that's really just the units in the periodics, and the action is actually via Adams operations. <clears throat> uh, and we've learned uh, that, in fact, this LK1 of S0 sits in a vibration. Uh, so this group here contains the roots of unity. That's a finite subgroup. Uh, and in fact, sort of this whole here, and, and this group is actually isomorphic to um, well, these finite subgroups. Uh, they are, uh, they form a, a direct factor, uh, and this group is isomorphic to u cross the copies, a copy of the additive periodics, given that if p is odd by units which are congruent one modulo p, or at p equals two units which are congruent one modulo four, <clears throat> um, and so you can form homotopy fixed points in two steps. Uh, you can first take homotopy fixed points with respect to this finite subgroup, and then with respect to the periodics. And if you do that, well, so you get, this is in fact just the same thing as this iterated homotopy fixed points. And the homotopy fixed points with respect to the periodics, that's something which in this context is something which is very simple. It's just given by the fiber So there's a vibration uh, which uh, displays these homotopy fixed points and thus the K1 local sphere as a vibration of a map, a self-map, which is given by psi minus 1. And psi, I mean, you can choose any uh, generator of the complementary factor, any topological generator of the, topolog uh, of the complementary factor. <clears throat> now, uh, if, mu, if P is odd, 
Uh, then this is a summand. This is the atom summand of P I D K theory. Uh, if P is equal to two, this is a real K theory, uh, two-adically completed. Uh, and the homotopy groups are, in both cases are well understood. Uh, they're very simple here. They're well understood here. They're more complicated, but certainly well understood there. And you have these vibrations, and we actually understand the K1 local uh, sphere. Uh, I mean, we know it's homotopy, and we, I mean, uh, that's a part that, of the homotopy groups of spheres that we really understand. I mean, as uh, Mike has pointed out, I mean, that's sort of how you detect the image of J. Huh? Well, the image of J is something which maps into the, uh, it's a sub, sub of the homotopy groups of S0, unlocalized, and you localize it, and you det detect it there. Okay, so that part is well understood, but let's, uh, before we move on to the case N equals two, uh, let's belabor that part a little bit, nevertheless, um, because, I mean, how, well, so how does it relate? Huh? How does it relate to the? Well, I mean, if you if you look at this E2 term, then what you uh, if you want to calculate this E2 term, uh, well, you might try to come up with a resolution with a projective resolution of the of Sn huh? of the periodic units, uh, and you can. Huh? Uh, but if you look at this at this group, uh, and sort of uh, let's make it more more uh, um, concrete, so if P is odd, uh, this is actually a group of order P minus one, and if P is two, it's, uh, it's plus minus one cross the two addicts. Huh? Now, this finite, so the P addicts is a, it's a very nice uh, P addict Lie group, and it's a continuous mod P cohomology, uh, it's very well understood, and it's clear, I mean, it's very well understood that it's a Poincare duality group of dimension one. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the mu p minus one sort of doesn't really matter much for more, if you're interested in mod p cohomology. Mm -hmm. uh, you still have a Poincare duality group of, of dimension one. Uh, if you look at mu two, that sort of messes up the homological algebra in the following sense. I mean, your, your group has infinite cohomological dimension. There's no chance of having any finite length uh, projective resolution. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at that, I mean, sort of, you don't, I mean, if the way I've described it, I mean, you hardly see the difference between the, between the primes. Huh? So what's going on? <clears throat> so what's going on is, I mean, there is a, behind this vibration, there's a short exact sequence of Morava modules. Uh, the Morava module is actually, you look at, uh, look at a spectrum X, you look at E star of X, there's an implicit localization, so it's, um, this is not quite, in general, this is not quite uh, the smash product. You have to, well, you have to localize it again. <clears throat> uh, but there's an action of E uh, by, by the group GN, and so you have an action of GN on this module. Uh, you have an action of pi star of E on this module, and uh, the group acts also on the coefficients, so you get a twisted, EN star GN module in general. Are we interested in the case N equals one? Now, um, <coughs> so <coughs> this short, uh, this, this vibration, uh, well, this vibration certainly gives you a long exact sequence in, in E star homology, but in fact, this long exact sequence turns out to be short exact. Uh, and so, uh, this vibration, E star of SO, which is the same as E star of LK1 of SO, uh, and you go to E star of EH mu, and you go to E star of EH mu, 
And in fact, um, there was a, well, this is a well-known result that this is the same, in fact, as continuous maps from the group. In fact, I mean, this would be group, this would be true for every, uh, for every finite subgroup of the stabilized group Gn at every level n. Uh, so this would be just a continuous homomorphism from Gn modulo mu into En star. Okay. Uh, and so that's channel, but we are going to use it in the, in the particular context. And so this group, I mean, all this, this is in channel. If you have a finite subgroup, it will not be a group. It will be just a coset space. But in our case, this happens to be, uh, the coset space happens to be CP uh, here as well. Uh, and in fact, <coughs> this short exact sequence um, is obtained from a short exact sequence in the category of well, where you have no, yeah, you have no EN star, EN star anymore. You just have uh, modules over the group GN. Um, so you have here, you take as a module GN, or well, G or S in our case, S1, modulo mu. Uh, now you have to be careful because you're in a, uh, in a completed setting. So this is not just the ordinary, uh, uh, free CP module on this as a basis, there are some completion process going on, which is hidden in these double brackets. Uh, and in fact, you have a short exact sequence of continuous S1 modules. Uh, and you obtain that by homing into EN star, or into E1 star. Now this, okay, um, so this is true whether, no matter whether the prime is odd or even. Now if the prime is odd, then because this group mu p minus one is prime to p, this is a projective S1 module. P is odd, but it's not projective. Uh, if p is equal to 2. Okay. This short exact sequence, for those who know a little bit of number theory, I mean, this sort of, uh, uh, this, this group ring is actually a power series ring. It's sort of the beginning of reverse Harvard theory, if you want. Um, uh, and it's sort of, uh, once you have that, it's very easy to see that you have short, such a short exact sequence. Huh? <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so this exact sequence reflects the fact, or is related to the fact, uh, that uh, the group S1 is, uh, well, is a f has finite cohomological dimension equal to one if P is odd, uh, but has infinite cohomological dimension if P is equal to two. Now, it's very nice to have these, uh, huh? I mean, the consequence is that they, we have this vibration of length. Huh? You, have just a, well, you have just one vibration between two things. If he, uh, if he insisted on working or understanding this group in terms of projective resolutions, we would not, fi we would not have sort of stumbled on such a vibration. Huh? Uh, so it's, uh, it's maybe good to give up the idea that we have to, uh, we, we insist on projective resolutions. Hmm? If you can find finite projective resolutions, great. But if you can't, uh, then maybe we should look for some sub a substitute <clears throat> and try to to sort of generalize the existence of these vibrations uh, to higher chromatic levels. Okay, my computer says I still have power for 48 minutes, so. <laughs> um, so what kind of resolution should we allow? Huh? Uh, 
Uh, well, so we should allow, in these resolutions, we should allow modules which are of this form. That means they are of the form GN modulo final group. Now the point is, if you have in our resolution such a gadget, then we hope to find some kind of geometric way of studying of LKN in which the homotopy fixed points for these finite subgroups will play a role. And the homotopy fixed points for these finite subgroups, I mean, they are much, much more tractable, much more accessible than the homotopy fixed points for the, for the full thing. And so you hope sort of to break things into smaller pieces which you can digest and, and assemble and and, and learn something in the end. <clears throat> okay, so there, was, there are different settings. I mean, such resolutions have been uh, constructed over the last 15 years, maybe. Uh, first at uh, n equals two huh? uh, and the prime three, and more recently at n equals two and the prime two. And I intend to say a little more about that. Uh, but there are sort of different kinds of resolutions which have shown up. Huh? There are resolutions, which, for those of you who have her talks about that, which are known under the name centralized resolutions. There are other, others which are known under the name duality resolutions. And so what the heck is going on? Huh? Um, so there is, I mean, there are these two resolutions and this, the duality resolutions tend to be very efficient and very, very nice for calculations. But in some sense, from a point of view of phonological algebra, they are, they are more mysterious. Huh? So let me start with something which is a little more, which has a little more, uh, uh, which, which, are which is better behaved from a point of view of homological algebra. <clears throat> so there's a point of relative homological algebra. Uh, and so you, know, you can set that up in sort of in, in, in a more general situation. You take some uh, poor finite group G. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe virtually pro P, huh? uh, so you suppose that maybe there's a finite index subgroup which is actually a pro P group, which is certainly the case in our in the, uh, for the stabilized groups, and you make an assumption. Uh, suppose uh, G has up to uh, has only finitely many. Contiguous classes of finite subgroups. Uh, the subgroups which are really important are the P subgroups, but let me not sort of belabor this point uh, too much. Huh? <clears throat> uh, so now you, uh, okay, so let's call this uh, collection F of G, or maybe just F if. We know what group we are talking about. <clears throat> and now you call a module, uh, let's say, P is F projective if uh, P is a direct summand in, uh, in a direct sum indexed over these Fs uh, in Fg. Uh, and for each F you take uh, a finite dimensional module M for this group F, and you induce it from F to the group G. Okay. Uh, so if M is a trivial module for F, and you induce it up, you just get, huh? uh, you get this permutation module. Um, Um, so you have a notion of F projectivity, and there's an associated name, uh, notion of F exactness. Uh, you call a, uh, you call a, a sequence of uh, CPG modules exact, well, if the composition is trivial, and if it remains exact, or if it becomes exact, if you map in a projective module. Okay? If you map in such a F projective module. Huh? So it's a related notion. 
of f exact sequences. And then there's a related notion of f resolutions. And the, uh, well, the, the, uh, the benefit of this uh, framework is that then in this uh, framework of, of a relative homological algebra, you have uniqueness for, uh, for f -re resolutions up to, well, up to the usual uh, ambiguity. I mean, it's unique up to unique chain homotopy equivalents. Uh, and, and so you can sort of control what you're doing uh, in terms of homological algebra. Huh? And there are sort of, uh, and the point is that there's a, it's a proposition Uh, this is sort of these are two independent uh, uh, papers, so one by myself, one by uh, Peter Simons, uh, which guarantees that uh, S n and G n have finite length f projective resolution. for every n and every p. Yeah? There, and in fact, in these projective resolutions, you don't, use, you don't have to use arbitrary modules n. No? I mean, it's not clear whether this is sort of the ideal setup. It's one setup possible. You might have a smaller collection of f projectives. Uh, so in, but in fact, what happens is uh, the uh, f projectives are direct summons. Uh, of modules of the form CPG uh, divided by F. And in fact, uh, well, we don't know that for, uh, we don't, uh, we have, this has not been proved, but I think the, the expected length of this resolution is N squared. Huh? Uh, but that's not known in general. Uh, the, no, the cases which we understand explicitly, uh, it's true. Uh -huh. OK, so let me not sort of belabor that point of view any further. Um, let me uh, instead sort of talk about, so in fact, and these, re these resolutions, uh, for those who know, uh, well, we might, sh maybe we should have called them F resolutions. Uh, but F is sort of maybe too generic, so I uh, like to call them centralized resolutions because the way I find them uh, are actually via uh, approximations of the cohomology of the uh, stabilizer group by centralizers of elementary abelian subgroups. Hmm? So that's, that's the, the reason for this name. Now there are these other resolutions, these competing resolutions, which from the point of view of calculations, and maybe also from other points of view, may be more attractive. Uh, but we don't really know that they always exist. Huh? Uh, they exist if the groups themselves are concrete duality groups, which they tend to be a lot of the time, but we are mostly interested, certainly at the prime two at the moment, we are mostly interested in the cases where they are not. Huh? And if they're only virtual duality groups, which they always are, that means they have finite index subgroups, which are duality groups, uh, then we don't know that these always exist. Uh, so, but they're known to exist uh, if n is equal to 2 and uh, for the critical primes where they're not, well, they're known to exist for n equals to 2 and, and p bigger than 5, or in general if, uh, or if p minus 1 does not divide n, uh, but uh, not in channel. Now, why are they called duality resolutions? Well, say, if n is equal to 2, or more, be, more, more generally, I mean, there will be resolutions of length n squared in the cases where we understand them. Let me call them cn, because we, I don't want to make you believe that they are always projective. Um, well, they are finite length resolutions. And in fact, uh, I mean, we call them duality resolutions. I mean, this is an ad hoc definition. 
if Cn squared minus i is isomorphic to Cr. Uh, in fact, there's more going on. I mean, also the maps are in some sense self too, uh, but let me not sort of belabor that point of view uh, too much. Um, and uh, so if you, if you go outside of this range, uh, so in fact, in this range, the, these will be projective resolutions which have this duality, uh, this self-duality behavior. Uh, but they are also known to exist if n is equal to 2 and p equal to 3 and n equals to 2 and p equals to 2. Uh, now, uh, so this has been the starting uh, work of, um, maybe not quite the starting point, but a decisive point in my development, uh, in my collaboration with Paul. Uh, so there's a, there's a paper uh, with, uh, with him, with Mark Mahowald and Charles Resk, uh, in which these resolutions, algebraic resolutions, have been first looked at and, and they have been topologically realized. We also knew at the time that these resolutions existed algebraically. Um, Well, in the early 2000s. Uh, but we didn't know at the prime two how to, how to realize them. Huh? And um, um, so, so these resolutions, okay, so that's maybe the homological algebra. Let me sort of uh, leave the homological algebra at this point uh, and say a few words about what is the homotopy theoretic relevance. Well, the homotopy theoretic relevance is, in fact, that these resolutions, they can be realized. Huh? All resolutions have been realized. So by that, I mean uh, there is, in fact, uh, it's a generalization of the thing which I've erased. I mean, the vibration, you have a sequence of, of uh, spectra you have a complex of spectra, see, if n is equal to, if n is equal to 2, it will be of length 4, again, where you count uh, starting by, with 0, not with 1, uh, to get the length right. Uh, and in fact, it's more than just a complex of spectra. You can sort of refine that. You can map, you can factor this map over the cool fiber of the first one, and then you can factor the next one over the cool fiber of this map. Uh, so that's important if you want to get some mileage out of that out of that in, in homotopy theoretic sense because that gives rise to a little spectral sequence. Uh, you can say it differently. You can either sort of refine that via fibers or via co-fibers. Um, and, but, uh, so that's, that's very good news. Uh, the, the sort of sad news is sort of we have to really manufacture them by hand. Huh? You have to beat the thing and have to sort of realize that all the obstructions which might exist for realizing them, for, for uh, factoring these uh, maps. Uh, they are actually in zero groups, or they are sort of in groups where, uh, where the ambiguity is big enough so that, um, so that the re realization exists. And so that has been done at p equals to 3 and n equals 2, um, again in this work with, um, with Paul, with Mark Mohwald, and and Charles Resk, and there we've constructed duality resolution, and for p equals, to, uh, p equals 2 and n equals 2, we got stuck at the time, uh, and sort of uh, this has been uh, this, this state of affairs that having been stuck for a long time uh, has been resolved sort of in the recent thesis. Well, they're no longer that recent, but they're still fairly recent, uh, of Agnes and of, uh, of Irina, and so we have these resolutions in fact, both resolutions, the centralized resolutions and the duality resolution. And so let me not try to get the attributions completely straight, but both names here are very, uh, very crucial. <clears throat> and so almost all the progress that we've made in the last 15 years sort of at the prime three, like understanding the chromatic splitting, understanding the Picard group, understanding uh, Brown-Cominet's duality, 
uh, all of that at the prime three depended on the existence of these resolutions. And in fact, we needed both. Huh? I mean, sort of the duality resolution is sort of behaves very nicely, but sometimes we know that it behaves so nicely only because we take the other one and sort of ask it for help when we get stuck. Uh, and, uh, and so at the prime two, I mean, there are, uh, we are more at the beginning or in the middle maybe of, uh, of an exciting development. Chromatic splitting, I think, is now understood. <coughs> this is uh, work with uh, Agnes and Paul. Uh, the Picard group is, is close to, to, to surrender, I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we, uh, with Agnes and with Irina and with Paul, uh, and uh, brown comets is, 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 is harder, but we'll see. Huh? Okay, um, now I wanted to, uh, I've announced this talk by saying I will talk about improvements and, and uh, simplifications. Uh, well, so what about improvements? I think there is an improvement, but I have to be a little careful uh, because uh, when, I, when I submitted the abstract, I was very convinced that everything works, and I still am, and I thought I will have the time actually to figure that out, but uh, I've been sort of kept busy by, uh, by Irina and by Agnes, and so I haven't really had the time I wanted, <coughs> but... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, recent improvements. Uh, let's see, likely improvements. Uh, we uh, to be careful. So uh, they are related to the fact, uh, which I wanted to push under the carpet, that there's this fine detail between uh, S n and G n. You know? And so, in particular, at the prime two, uh, at n equals two. Uh, we have S2 and we have G2, which is S2 semi-direct with a Galois group. So it's a uh, group of order two. And, and uh, at, at odd primes, the fact that this group is of order two uh, makes, makes the passage from, from here to here fairly easy. Hmm? So uh, maybe for reasons of time, I will not be labeled that. At the prime two, well, we have the same kind of picture. But now the uh, Galois group is of order two. It's the same as the prime. And so that does not make this transition sort of form. Hmm? Uh, it's, and in fact, I think the improvement is sort of just a slight point of changement of point of view. I think we've been insisting too long, I believe, huh? uh, of trying to understand the trivial module CP as huh? as a CP G2 module. And I think that was the wrong, I, I believe that's the wrong point of view. Because in fact, I mean, the modules, if you're looking at cohomology uh, of this group with coefficients in modules, but the modules are not arbitrary CP GN modules or CP G2 modules. I mean, well, you have to be careful if you don't take the right axis, you get out of this category anyway. But if you have sort of finite axis or if you have the sphere, I mean, there are modules over that. But in fact, there's also the, uh, there's W there. And the action of the Galois group is not by, uh, well, it's by, it's by complex, well, it's by, it's by the Galois, uh, it's by the, well, the action on W uh, of the Galois group is the usual action. And so in fact, uh, should, uh, huh? Instead, uh, try or study uh, you take W with its Galois structure. So uh, you take uh, Frobenius as a generator of the Galois group. Uh, and we should look at that as a module over a twisted group. There's an appropriate twisted grouping. And we should look at that as modules over that. And I believe. Uh, that in fact the resolutions we have for GN or for SN can be promoted to resolutions uh, of W phi over these <coughs> over these twisted group rings, uh, and then sort of we will we should be able to realize them, and uh, and that sort of 
I mean, that's pleasant. I mean, one has to say that so far the fact that we have, so I'm, I'm coming back also to something that an assignment that uh, Agnes gave me, I think, in, implicitly in her talk. Now she, she was talking about a resolution of a group which she denoted G21. If you remember, that's fine. If not, then just sort of, you're allowed to go home at this point. Um, <clears throat> um, and, uh, and in fact, what we've been constructing, if you're honest, uh, if you're honest here at the prime two, uh, we have not, the duality resolution is not something which is for the group G2, it's also not group for the group G21, it's a group, it's for this group, and this group does not have the Galva group built in. Uh, this is a pain in the neck. Huh? It comes up again and again and again and again, and each time you beat it and you sort of say, well, it's not really a serious problem, but it's sort of a pain in the neck. Huh? So I think it's, uh, it, will be, it will be pleasant to really have this, this settled by this approach, but uh, I think we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit, uh, but I think I'm very optimistic. Well, so that was sort of the improvement. And the other one is the simplification. Uh, well, I had a brilliant idea, I thought. Um, and, but, uh, well, that's what friends are there for. They, <laughs> they sometimes have to get you back on the ground. And when I presented this brilliant idea to Paul about a couple of weeks ago, he sort of pointed to an immediately to a weakness in the argument, and I think it's fallen apart. So, uh, so I fear that this is sort of, uh, this is gone. <clears throat> um, let, me, let me finish by making a few more remarks on Paul, uh, on the collaboration, on, on other things which have been said during this week. Uh, so, I mean, I would never dare challenging uh, sort of the truth of Mike's story about what happened last uh, summer <laughs> in Evanston. I mean, how could I? I mean, I wasn't there, so. <laughs> but I must say, I mean, I cannot confirm that story. I mean, I don't have anything, I don't have anything sort of which would uh, come remotely close. In fact, I mean, I've tried to think about it and I've had a hard time remembering any time when Paul was really seriously upset or even mildly upset. It's sort of remarkable. I mean, he stays calm, I mean, no, no matter what happens. And uh, it's almost unbelievable. <clears throat> and so I thought even harder. And so I remember very, very vaguely. I mean, so he's, he's been chairman. He's been chairman for the second time. So he must have had moments when he got upset. I mean, it's impossible huh, to imagine that this never <laughs> happens. <laughs> and so I remember. I remember a remark, and I'm not sure whether he was chairman at the time or not. It could have been so long ago that it was in another, uh, in another function within the department. So I think there was, a play, there was a time when he was sort of kind of upset. But he, his solution was just sort of, let's ignore it. <laughs> he just sort of ignored the problem. Uh, I mean, he, put it, he just didn't pay attention to it. Uh, and I think that's much more, uh, I think for me, that's much more plausible than and he would slap somebody in the face. But. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, it's been a great uh, privilege to, uh, and a great pleasure to, to have been able to collaborate with you for maybe 15 years, maybe longer, a little longer even. Uh, thanks a lot for that, and happy birthday. Well, it's not finished yet, I think, but uh, we, we are optimistic that, um, I'm sort of reasonably optimistic that maybe by the time that I will retire, we'll understand things. <clears throat> and it's for a new generation sort of to define their problems. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, so that the results we've applied these things to, uh, they depend on some hard calculations, but sort of the results like chromatic splitting, like uh, Picard group, uh, like uh, 
uh, brown Cominets duality, I mean, that's sort of, these are structural results. No? So one could hope, well, I could hope that maybe one can actually continue, but I don't really know because, I mean, they really do depend on some hard calculations. And these hard calculations for higher height, I don't, they're really, they're really hard. Huh? It's sort of, I mean, even if you can do it, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure whether you can communicate them. Huh? Uh, so, uh, so the question is more, I mean, what are good questions to ask in the future? And I, I think uh, I, I really liked uh, Mike's talk in that respect. So he's pointed to some structural things. Uh, I think it would be good to, to find more uh, such problems which have the potential to be uh, approachable and uh, for, for higher heights. Uh, the explicit calculations are so, are so hard. I mean, the, uh, it's, 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 I, don't, I, I would not want to go on uh, at higher heights. But who knows? I mean, there are sort of uh, this, some of these people, some of these younger people, they have, they have infinite energy. You know? <laughs> Thank you.